let me welcome you all to Psalm 95, which many of you know in song from Friday night. It's the opening. I'm glad we have Kanner Shula here. Maybe she'll even sing a little bit at the end. She doesn't have to. I'm not, I'm putting her on the spot only because I'm seeing her and I know I love hearing her. But our psalms are meant to be sung and Kabbalat Shabbat was meant to be sung. So a little bit about Kabbalat Shabbat of which Psalm 95 is the opening. Psalm 95 to 99 then Psalm 28, then L'chadodi, then the Psalm of Shabbat, Psalm 92, and then Psalm 93, which is normally the Psalm of Friday. What these Psalms have in common, 93 to 99, is they are called royal Psalms, Psalms that extol God as King with a theme of gratitude. They are songs, songs, here in the beginning of this particular psalm, let us sing joyfully to Adonai. Let us shofar blast. Others translate it as, as let our songs revel um, to the rock of our deliverance. So there's this quality of celebration. Kabbalat Shabbat, as an addition to our Friday night, was developed in the school of Moshe Cordovero. Moshe Cordovero was an important mystical teacher who lived in Svat, 1522 to 1570. So 16th century. And he would be the master of compiling the mystical writings before him and almost creating a platform for the development of Jewish mysticism. He was only 46 years old, 46, he was only 26 years old when he wrote a book called Pardes Rimonim, the orchard of pomegranates that harvested so much of Jewish mystical writing. It would be he, him in that book that would develop the 10 spherot that would be developed by one of his students and that was Isaac Luria. And Luriana Kabbalah would blossom as a new phase, but built on the foundation of Moshe Cardovero. And Moshe Cardovero is the one who had his disciples go out into the fields, you know, between Sfat and Maron. Maron, of course, is the burial place for the ostensible writer of the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and they would go out into the fields on Friday to greet the Shabbat queen, the Shabbat bride, based on an image that I shared in my letter of description for today from the Talmud. And so these psalms were put in the Sidur as an extension of that going out into the fields to greet the Shabbat bride with Yedid Nefesh and the Chadodi written in Sfat in the 16th century. But the choice of these psalms were six psalms to create the passageway from the six days of work to the repose of Shabbat with the Chadodi, the composition that was the gatekeeper that Ruvain Kimmelman, an important teacher of Jewish thought at Brandeis University, has an entire book in Hebrew analyzing the Lecha Dodi, that song of welcome of the Shabbat bride, as a distillation of the teachings of Moshe Cordovero. Yeah. And so Psalm 95, without further ado, let us put it up and Hear the song of Psalm 95. If everyone can just check that you are on mute. Oh, here, I you don't need to check. I can check. I'll take care of it. One second. Okay. Okay. 
Psalm 95. Let us sing joyfully to Adonai. Adonai. Let us show for blast to the rock of our deliverance. Let us advance before God's presence with thanks. With psalms, let us raise voices to God. For a great ail is Adonai and great king over all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are gods. For the sea is gods, and God made it, and the dry land God's hands formed. Let us bow down and fall to our knees. Let us bend the knee before Adonai, our Maker. For God is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the flock of God's hand. Today, if only to God's voice you would listen. Do not harden your heart as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness when your ancestors tested me, tried me, though they had seen my deed. Forty years I loathed the generation, and I said, A people of straying hearts are they, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my anger, they shall never come to my resting place. Now this psalm is clearly in two parts. The first part is that of celebration. Let us go sing joyfully to Adonai as if one is a pilgrim on the way to Jerusalem. And the leader of the band says, let us go, let us sing joyfully. And by the last verse, God is speaking now, they shall never come to my resting place. Quite a reversal that for many is troubling. The divide is verses 1 to 7, and then I put in italics verses 8 to 11, for that is God's voice. Do not harden your heart. So if only to God's voice you would listen at the end of 7, 7 has this bridge today if only to God's voice you would listen. And then the voice, whether of the psalmist speaking on behalf of God, or if you're more prophetic in orientation, psalmist hearing God's voice, but it's a voice of frustration, strong frustration. Verse 10, 40 years I loathe the generation, which is to say, verses 8, to 11 look back verses 1 to 7 look forward a, a writer of a commentary in england to psalms w graham scrogey he said using alliterations you can split the psalm into two parts privilege and peril looking on and looking back, exaltation and examination, worship and warning. And so we begin at the beginning with this sense of rejoicing. Mind you, for Kabbalat Shabbat, it's traditional that a mourner does not come into the room for the first six psalms not till the end of Lechadodi. For these psalms, again, they're about God as the King of Kings, God the Creator, and we are grateful. They are songs with a tone of celebration. And a mourner who is in that place of the shadow of loss only enters at the end of Lechadodi, if you will, after all the festive singing. And so the festive singing will have seven, and this, of course, is purposeful. Well, we anticipate it's purposeful. Seven different expressions in the first seven verses of rejoicing and honoring God. One, let us go sing. Two, let us have the shofar blast. 
And again, Naria can also be shouting of joy. Let us advance. Nikadma, often translated as let us greet. But I wanted to keep the before. And so I like also the choice of advance to convey this seems to be a processional. Four, let us raise voices. Naria lo. And again, in my translations, I put God in brackets so as not to be using, as is the Hebrew, the he with a capital H. And now verses 6 and 7. Let us bow down, fall to our knees. Let us bend the knee before Adonai, our maker. So it goes from loud sounds to quiet as we are moving from, if you will, the image of processional to the destination, which is bowing down before God. But there's something that the careful reader may note, which is, in Hebrew, there are different words used for bowing. In the temple, not unlike what we do distinctly on the high holy days, they would fully prostrate before God. God in prayer. They would go with face to the ground. Think of Islamic prayer. They stopped doing that. The rabbis stopped doing it with the rise of Christianity and then Islam to distinguish how we pray from them because them were the major powerful religions amongst whom Jews lived. And so we simply bow at our hips when we do the Alenu, for instance, where we get the you know, these different verbs of bowing. But here, verse 6, we bow down, we fall to our knees, and then it's like we back up, let us bend the knee. Benjamin Siegel says that there's a mixing of the act of prayer, almost as if we are so elated in our singing, we're mixing up the order so that it's not linear, because the, again, those verbs are linear. And I chose, instead of, as in Robert Alter, which is uh, let, bow and kneel, which is simpler, what I did is the fuller, bow down and fall to our knees, let us bend the knee to convey the expression more clearly that these are different verbs for different qualities of bowing. Though Rabbi Samson, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch of Frankfurt of the 19th century would say in reference to the second half of verse 6 that that's the inner quality. That the first half, let us bow down and fall to our knees, describes the physical act let us bend the knee is the inner dimension of submission before God. And so there are these seven qualities expressed here of coming into God's presence and worship. And then there's a bridge, the bridge between the two halves. Hayom, today, im bakolo, if, circle, if, only, with his voice, or to his voice, to God's voice, you, plural, would listen. I emphasize you, plural, tishma'u, in that throughout this psalm, it is in the plural. The psalmist is singing on behalf of the community, or if you will, inviting the community to sing along. There's some wonderful commentaries on this bridge, so I'll pause. Today, if only to God's voice, you would listen. It's a bridge that can point in both directions, to rejoicing or what will follow, which is God's upset. The Vilna Gaon, the great teacher of Lithuania, of Vilna, in the... 1700, same time around George Washington, he would say, because the context of verse 7 is pasture, God is shepherd, 
you know, the, the God of Psalm 23, also Ezekiel 34, 31, God of Shepherd, that this is a gentle request, that this is the God saying, as your shepherd, please listen to my voice. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, by the way, the Vilna Gaon would excommunicate the Hasidim, who were the rising competition. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav would be the founder's great-grandson. So his mother was the granddaughter of the Baal Shem Tov. He was a great teacher. Some say Eli Wiesel is among them, that he was the first modern writer and that he wrote allegories. You know, the messenger who has this difficult journey finally reaches the destination and then forgets the message he's supposed to convey. So that's Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaff. And Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaff would say, today, if only to God's voice you would listen. Today, because it can be overwhelming to think about listening to all that God has to say and to be able to be obedient to all that God has to do. Live your life only one day at a time. So pre-shadowing AA's, you know, living for the day, was Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav in the middle of the 19th century playing with the word today. Backing up, I had in my introductory letter to today that beautiful story from the Talmud in Sanhedrin 98a of Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi who meets up with Elijah at the gates. I told you about Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai. This is the cave in which Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai would hide for 13 years with his son, Rabbi Elazar. And Rabbi Shimon bar, Rabbi Yehoshua says to Elijah, when's the Messiah coming? And he says, go to the gates of Rome. You can ask the Messiah yourself. He sits among the lepers, except he's distinctive. He's wrapping his bandages one leg at a time because if he gets called, he wants to be able to respond immediately. And so Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi goes and he finds the Messiah. And he says, Messiah, when are you coming? And the Messiah answers in one word. Hayom, today, the word here in verse 7. And the day comes and it goes, and the Messiah never makes a public appearance. And so Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, back in Israel, goes back to Elijah, and he says, Elijah, I don't understand it. The Messiah said, Hayom, today. And Elijah said, well, the today was not literally the day on the calendar. It was the Today of Psalm 95, today, if only to God's voice, you would listen. On that day, I will come when everybody listens. And the Yerushalmi in Ta'anit, which is the tractate, that's the Talmud of Israel, which is edited about 100 years before the Talmud of Babylonia, roughly 400 instead of 500, Ta'anit, one, one will say, again, focusing on Hayom. If all of Israel observed but one Shabbat, the heir of David would arrive. And then it quotes Exodus 16, 25, in which as Moses gives the instructions for the eating of manna, Moses will say, Achalahu Hayom eat of it on this day, ki Shabbat hayom ladonai, for it is the Sabbath, this day, for God. So hayom is used in Exodus 16, 25, regarding mana, as it is here, to refer to Shabbat. If you only observed one Shabbat, I would come, the Messiah. Now God's voice. Here, God is speaking, upset, looking back. Do not harden your heart as at Mibribaz in the day of Massah in the world of 
in the wilderness. Those are the two places, but they appear twice in the Bible. Numbers 20, 13, before that, Exodus 17, in which the people want water. And the first time God says to Moses, hit the rock and the water will come. That's Exodus. He does. Water comes. And Moses will say, but you didn't trust God. You know, you had to have me intervene. And then again in Numbers 20, now toward the end of the march, they're complaining about the lack of water. And God says, just talk to the rock. And instead, Moses hits it twice. And that'll be the end of Moses' opportunity to enter into the promised land. And so that's the place called Masa Omeriva. It's the same name for both of those incidences of the water, the water from the rock. When your ancestors tested me, and here's a word play, Masa means tested, and Nisuni, eight and nine, Masa and Nisuni, the place where you tested me. And now, 40 years I loathe the generation, and I said, a people of straying hearts are they, and they do not know my ways. Well, here's a conflation, because God's declaration that they will not enter into the promised land, that does not occur at Massah and Merivah. That's not for their complaining about the water. That is Numbers 13 and 14, the story of the spies. So there's a, the, the condemnation. So I swore in my anger, they shall never come to my resting place. That swearing, that condemnation, that the generation that went out from Egypt will not enter into the promised land is not relating to Masama Rava, but the spies. So it gets conflated. If you will, the 40 years, as in verse 10, are all put together. And as God looks back, God says, those were such awful years for me. The people were constantly rebelling, culminating in my declaration that they won't enter into the land. So I swore in my anger. And again, this notion, this anthropopathic quality, this emotional, human emotion that's given to God, of God being angry, swearing they shall never come to my resting place. And here too, the closing word has multiple possibilities of meaning. Menuchati, linked with nishbati, the swearing. Deuteronomy 12, 9, I swore refers to the land of Israel, that I would give them Eretz of Adchalav Udvash, the land flowing with milk and honey. And yet in another place, Numbers 10.33, Menuchati is simply a resting place for where the ark could be laid to rest. In the Talmud, this word Menuchati, in this context, will be interpreted in Sanhedrin 110a to be eternal rest of the world to come. Meaning, those people in the desert, and there's a whole debate in Sanhedrin 110a, whether the people in the desert will inherit the world to come or not. Split on it. And the last way, menuchati, which literally means resting, is not a place, but spatially a place, meaning Shabbat. They shall never come to my rest. And that comes back to this being the psalm of approaching Shabbat. Now, in the last few minutes, some closing thoughts. For the rabbis of the Middle Ages, this was a psalm of the Messianic era. This would be a psalm according to Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi in Sforno, that is a psalm to be sung by future generations in the time of the Messianic wholeness, in which they will recount the difficulty of the past and celebrate a universal harmony. Because God is the creator, and all these psalms of Kabbalat Shabbat 
with this poetic language from the depths of the earth in verse four to the heights of the mountains, from the sea to the land. So horizontally and vertically, all the gods, God is king over all gods, verse three. Some understand that to mean over the angels and over natural forces. Others mean it as a statement of God is supreme. Whatever idolatry people may engage in, an elilim can be here, Elohim, an elilim. God is the God over all idols. And so this is the psalm that acknowledges God's supremacy as creator, the sole creator. Now, two different ways this trajectory is understood. One, quoted by Benjamin Siegel, is Yehuda Waxman. I think he's an Israeli Bible scholar. And he sees this as three phases of a leader trying to get people to pay attention and be obedient to God. First, he says, let's praise. They don't praise. He says, then remember how God, how great God is to evoke a sense of wonder and, and obedience. And then there's this closing, damn it, pay attention. God can get angry. So that's how Yehuda Waxman understands it, kind of as a linear growing frustration. But I like better the understanding of Rabbi Eddie Feld. And Rabbi Eddie Feld is the man who edited the Siddur we use and who edited the commentary on Siddur Lev Shalem. And he, you know, has commentaries around all the Psalms. This is a Psalm of Kabbalat Shabbat. And he describes it as follows. It's a pilgrimage toward the temple on its immediate context. And the leader says, with great anticipation, let us sing to God. We'll get there and we'll bow down to God. And then along the journey, as people are starting to get tired, he says, don't lose perspective. Remember in the desert how they lost perspective and began to complain? Stay focused. We will get there and we will find menuchati, that rest, unlike them who complained. Let us remember our purpose. And by analogy, every week with Kabbalat Shabbat, these six psalms that lead toward the psalm of Shabbat, we are throughout our week on a journey, a journey of anticipation of menuchati, yom menuchati, the day of rest, and keeping our eye on the prize is essential. And that enables us to reach our destination and to savor it, to be able to sing joyfully in community before God. And so with that, I will pause. It, we had different reasons in recent times of not gaining your reactions. We had some singing all last week, which was wonderful. But I wanted to harvest a few of your reactions to Psalm 95 before we return to honoring Lee and Marion and our closing Kaddish. So, Ahuva Ho, Psalm 95, go ahead. I have to unmute. The third part of the psalm does look contradictory. Uh, it does look uh, very um, negative. God is uh, remembers what happened in during those forty years in the wilderness. However, I see it as differently. I think that these, the last two verses should be read in a past perfect, meaning that God said that what happened in those days, not now, in those mm -hmm. days. However, the psalmists say, you see, 
this is what happened. And there is an in there, there's a condition, condition there. And it's like the psalmist said, yes, there was a condition and we, we stood up and we changed. And now look, we are in, in the land of Israel. We do have a temple. We do praise God. It's ha it has changed. And this is the beauty, I think, of the psalm. See, mm -hmm. in spite of what had happened, look where we are today. That's beautiful, Ahuva. And I, I will add with Ahuva's comment that some earlier Bible scholars felt that this was two psalms that got put together. And more recent Bible scholars seem to have discarded that along the lines that Ahuva you described, that this is a journey and there's the quality at the end of saying, the psalmist, that was then but not now, pointing to a new phase in which the bridge that, you know, im bekoloti shma'u, if you listen, we are listening and we, it will be different for us than it was then. So thank you. And um, it's interesting to see how Bible scholars also have phases of understanding, which is only natural. Kanner Shula, tell us which is your favorite part of singing this song. Uh, well, first of all, I want to tell you, give you a very small comment on vocal stuff. Yes. At my age and stage, I really don't sing in public anymore before without knowing in advance because I need a warm up. I used I to be you. able to get out of bed and really <laughs> let it rip. Can't do it anymore. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, I wanted to make a little, just a little tiny language comment. Sure. Uh, about uh, verse seven, which you just mentioned again, where it says, Hayom im bekoloti shma'u. Yeah. Uh, if you listen to his voice, that lishmoa bekol is an idiomatic phrase. It's actually an idiom, as you mentioned earlier, just so people understand. It's really not only the passive listening. What lishmoa bekol means is to obey. Yes. That is what those two words. So it's it's important that people know that. They're not only being told, listen to God's voice, because you can listen very nicely and then go about your business. And your business may not always be all that godly. But yes. what Lishmoa Bekol really means as an idiom is to obey. Just wanted to make that little comment that that's what's really said. Thank you for that emphasis on Bekolo Tishma'u verse seven before God begins to speak or as if God is speaking is not just listening, but simultaneously it's listening that leads to following, obeying. Im um, if you listen, meaning means if you obey. So that's very important. Thank you, uh, Shula, for, the, for that and the context making. One last um, comment to be able to reflect on this psalm for today. Irene, did you unmute yeah. yourself? Go ahead, Irene. Yeah. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I don't want to. No, I'm happy. Over. Please. I, I've I've recently had to teach that psalm to um, Christian clergy that wanted someone Jewish, and I was recommended. And I'm afraid to say that they use at least the end of that psalm to prove that we have got no right to Israel. They, they interpret Menucha not as you have in all different ways. They are using excuses. Um, that's the first. The second, again, I hope you don't mind, Rabbi um, Ellie. No, no, I'm not please trying to do. Rude, no, no, I, I, know very, I know you're very Hasidic, but I really must defend the Vilma Gaon. The Vilma okay. Gaon didn't have official Samicha. He was a genius, and he, he, he um, was very interested in Kabbalah and what we would now call Hasidism but he was very uh, afraid of what might happen. I studied what happened with Shabbatai Tzvi, who took up the Kabbalah, and you probably know, 90% of Europe um, joined him, even Samuel Pepys in his diary about the fire of London in 1666. There's all these very sensible Jews are following this, this man who's, who's definitely sick. Um, so the point is, 
in my area, the uh, Bratislavas leave their wives at Rosh Hashanah to go to Uman to worship him. So they've turned a man into a god and they're causing the COVID. I'm not trying to, no, you no, know, because my daughter lives in Sfat and she's very keen on all this stuff. But I have to, Vilma Gowan has recently been compared by a very top Jewish historian who's very superficial in Britain in a very popular book to Hamas, whereas the, the Baal Shem Tov is like Jesus. I mean, this is what's happening. I mean, we have to realize that he was not, he, he wasn't like a chief rabbi where I would agree with you. He saw what might happen if there are no boundaries. And that's, you know, I'm, I hope you don't mind me. So I'm not trying to criticize you no, no, in no. any way. But being European, I'm more aware of what goes on. It's not California, which is a massive, you know, continent almost. In Europe, these sorts of things are right. causing death now from COVID because they think you can just go out and love everybody in 20,000 at a funeral. And he, the Vilma Gowan is a very great person who was terribly humble. And so during the Holocaust, hmm, sorry. So let me just pull this together only because of time, Irene, and that's very helpful. Yeah. Again, what I described was the the edict mm -hmm. of the Vilna Gaon, not the motivation yeah. for the Vilna Gaon. I had the privilege to be in Vilna a year and a half ago and to mm -hmm. stand next to the great um, synagogue of the Vilna Gaon, which was the center of the city. And the city has a statue of the Vilna Gaon because he was a larger than life figure, not just for Jews, but for non-Jews. So I'll just say a word to honor your commentary, Irene, which is very helpful to me as well. And that is the Vilna Gaon's commentary here on verse seven. See, the Vilna Gaon was what's called the Misnagin, which is the one opposed to the Hasidism, but he's often caricatured as being very, you know, strict and cold, but precisely the commentary of him in verse seven is one of great warmth in which he says the context of today, if only to God's voice, you would listen is the first half of the verse is God as the shepherd, the caring God. And that for the Vilna Gaon, this admonition was done in a context of love. And again, why the Vilna Gaon condemned Hasidism, which was a growing movement, is complex. It was political, political in the sense of about the movement, not about a love of God or of a worldview that was responsible. And the last piece that Irene mentioned, Shabtai Tzvi, the classic biography of him is by Gershom Sholem. It's a very thick biography, who was a important religious figure in the 1600s that led to chaos when this man so widely believed to be the Messiah who would bring the Jews back under the Ottoman Empire's control, bring them back to Israel. And then with the demand of the caliphate converted to Islam, lest he be killed, led to people losing faith in Judaism and in God. And so I understand how the rabbis like the Vilna Gaon as community leaders were very cautious about false messiahs. And Hasidism, which has this ecstatic dimension of coming into the immediacy of God's presence, not unlike Shabtai Tzvi, who had an ecstatic dimension that even justified his behavior as going into the side of darkness to bring out holy sparks um, was seen as dangerous. So Irene, thank you for reminding and giving a little bit of a larger context to this tension between Hasidim and Misnagdim. With that, always with an eye on the clock, knowing that uh, many are able to join us because we stay within the time frame. I want to return to giving Marion a word to say honoring Lee's Yurtzeit. I will add, Marion has her birthday on February 8th, which is partly what prompted my asking Marion to be honored today. But again, it was last week, her husband's second Yurtzeit. 
So Marion, a word in closing. I just, I just want to thank you, Rabbi, and all of you for this opportunity to study uh, making Psalms more accessible. Normally I would read them on Shabbat or you know, just rip right through them and not even think about what they were really meaning. Uh, you've added poetry, uh, new Hebrew words to my very limited Hebrew vocabulary. And it, it brightens my day to be here with all of you. And I, I think it would brighten Lee's too if he were here. Thank you, Mary. And it brightens my day to share it with you. And I'm honored to be able to honor you. And on this moment to help with the leading of Kaddish honoring Lee Brockett. If there are others who are saying Kaddish for a yurt site or in mourning, I invite you to join together. Yitkadal vi yitkadash shemei rabah bi alma di brak yurute vi alich malchute bechaye chom yomei chom uvchaye dechol beit Yisrael. Ba'agalau bizman kari bimru amein. Yehesh me raba me barach leolamol me omaya. Yit barach v'yishtabach v'yitpa'ar v'yitromam v'yitnase v'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal shemei d'kugsha v'richu. Le'ela minkol birchata v'shirata, tush b'chata v'nechemata, d'aviran v'alma v'imru amein. Yehe shlama raba v'shemaya, v'chayit aleinu v'alkol Yisrael v'imru amein. Ose shalom b'mamav v'yaase shalom. Aleinu v'yokol Yisrael v'kol yokvei tevel v'imru amen. Thank you each for participating. Tomorrow is the second of the Kabbalat Shabbat Psalms. Again, there are six. Today was identified with Sunday. Tomorrow, Psalm 96 will be identified with Monday. Tomorrow's psalm is a psalm that was put to much classical music and is also sung as part of the liturgy in churches on Christmas Eve. So Psalm 96 tomorrow. Thank you all for sharing in Psalm 95.